Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the last days of the Roman Republic in our continuing study of the history of civilization. In the second century before Christ, we have a issue of rising government corruption in the city of Rome. There was a growing gap between the rich and the poor. The, the rich kept getting richer. The poor, the, the basic yeoman farmer uh, who just had his farm and he went out and worked, uh, he couldn't compete with these great estates that were filled with uh, slave labor. Uh, and of course, Rome's conquest had given it a, an abundance of, of slaves. In fact, slaves, uh, the price of slaves was an all-time low. You have a two-party system during this part, uh, during this time. Now, we already talked about the, how you had the Senate and then the Centurion Assembly, um, but that's not what we're speaking of here. We actually have two groups within those two groups, the Optimates, uh, who are largely powerful in the Senate. Uh, these are the folks who, want, they're the conservative party. They want to keep things the way it's always been. They sort of want to keep power in the Senate, power in the aristocracy. And then the opposite of them are the popularities, the, the party of the people. Um, it's tempting to, to describe these two parties in terms of today's Republicans and Democrats. Um, and, and perhaps there are some similarities uh, between those two. Um, you have a citizen militia that Rome had always had. Uh, whenever they had times of war, those you know farmers and just regular Romans would would leave their farms, would leave their work, and they would go and serve in the military. But now we're going to see a professional soldier who no longer will have his loyalty to to the state, but now will begin more and more having his loyalty to his general and that's going to change the face of things in Rome. This is also the time of bread and circuses. Um, that time's not really going to go away. Um, by bread and circuses, circuses you don't think clowns and trapeze artists, uh, but rather uh, this is the time of the chariot race. Um, and people would go for their free entertainment, and free food would be given, and who, whatever politician could provide bread and circuses, uh, he had all the votes because people were voting um, just on the things that they would like to have. And so votes were readily available to anyone who could come up with the money to provide bread and circuses. Now, in order to obtain that money, uh, that was going to be the job of the governors. In fact, they were going to be given the title procurators. Uh, these are localized governors in over the different uh, locales, the different uh, areas that Rome had conquered. And a procurator, his job was to procure taxes and send that money back to Rome. Uh, it had been said, I think it was Julius Caesar who might have quipped, that a procurator typically spent his first year in office uh, collecting all the money that was going to be used to, um, to pay back the bribes that got him into office. And then he would s spend his second year in office collecting money that would uh, pay off the bribes that would keep him out of prison once he got thrown out of office. And then uh, any time after that, he would be collecting money that would fund his future retirement fund. And the Roman um, Senate didn't care as long as they got their cut. Um, the procurators were in business to supply Rome with money, and anything extra they uh, were able to uh, collect, that became, you know, that was well and good. That was, that was their added uh, pay benefit. One uh, group that, that begins to stand up against this corruption are the Gracchi brothers, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. Uh, they are the maternal grandchildren. Their mother had been the daughter of Scipio Africanus, and her claim to fame was that, that she was the, the, uh, the daughter of Scipio Africanus, and, and she quipped one day that, that she longed for the day when her claim to fame would be that she would be known as the the mother of the Gracchi, and certainly uh, we know her in both ways today. Uh, Tiberius was older, and he championed the cause of the commoner. Um, he had uh, gone to Spain in part of a military endeavor, and uh, he had tried to uh, make some treaties, but then came back and found that the Senate blocked his treaties, um, even though he had given his word. Uh, the Senate didn't care about things like that. And he's seeking to give... Uh, give um, money and help to those who were poor to you know sort of get a farm going and 
and the Senate blocks him at every stance, and he's opposed by the Senate. Uh, indeed, at one point, a riot breaks out, and um, he's got the he's he's come to understand that they're out to try to kill him, and uh, uh, some of his followers are on the other side of the hall, and they're saying, "What's going on?" and and he points to his head. They're they're trying to take my head, and, and the others in the Senate said, "Look, he's pointing to his head. He's trying to make himself a king," and they they kill him and they throw his body into the Tiber River. And years later, Gaius uh, rises also and becomes a leader uh, and, and, again, stands for the people and likewise is put to death. So uh, both of these brothers die in service of the people uh, at the hands of the Senate. Now, next we want to talk about Marius. Uh, Marius was a new man. By that, uh, we mean that he didn't come from a long and... Uh, noble family. Uh, he was a very popular pol politician, a very capable and able general, but his real gift was in influencing people. He could talk, it seems that he could talk people into almost anything. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, he s comes back from his wars and he seeks land grants for his veterans. And as, as convincing as he can be, uh, the Senate is going to try to block him. And so what he will do, he'll go around the Senate. He, he's opposed by the Senate, but instead he will, go, uh, he will take his, his laws, his ideas to the Centurion Assembly, bypassing the Senate. And that just wasn't done. Um, but he's going to do that. Uh, and so he uses these sorts of strong-arm tactics to, to pass the bills that he wants passed. Um, and he's, ha he's going to have a young nephew we'll be talking about next time, uh, a nephew named Julius Caesar. Uh, and, and Julius Caesar perhaps can be described as a sort of a chip off the old block. Now, a war breaks out, and, and th this whole history is almost like one war after the other. This is called the Social War. Uh, it's a war between Rome and her Italian allies who wanted Roman citizenship. Um, and citizenship was a very closely guarded thing. And, and these uh, allies, especially uh, on the Italian peninsula, are seeking this citizenship and they're willing to fight for it. And the Roman Senate just won't let it go. And uh, Rome wins the war, as Rome wins every war uh, during this period. But after they had won the war, now citizenship is given to the Italians. Uh, and so uh, they, they won't do it under the threat of war, but once the war is won, then that citizenship is extended. And the two heroes of the war had been our old friend Marius, but also one of his new lieutenants, Sulla. And these two names are going to continue to come up um, because Marius, uh, he's very popular among the people, and Sulla is up and coming. He'd like to be very popular among the people, um, and, but he's looking for his day in the sunshine. Marius is getting, getting older now, uh, but Sulla wants to be the next popular person. Uh, and Sulla uh, is a strong conservative. Uh, Sulla believes that the Senate, um, nothing should ever change, and the Senate should have all the power. And, uh, of course, Marius is getting his popularity from the people. Now, Mithridates of Pontus, way over in the east, and I'm only showing a portion of his kingdom here because it actually wraps around the, the east side of the Black Sea and all the way up into what today is called Ukraine. Uh, Mithridates of Pontus has seen the uh, how the Roman, and it's becoming an empire now, how the Roman Empire and the Roman states are are getting bigger and bigger and so he's an enemy of Rome he does not want to see this and he uh, organizes a, uh, a number of his allies and in 88 BC on a certain day he has a, a huge assassination a massacre of Italians that take place any any Roman living in no, not just Pontus but all throughout Anatolia and all throughout Greece are put to death, and it is estimated that on a single day, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80,000 Romans are assassinated, are killed in this huge terrorist plot. Um, and so the Romans are going to go and send a general to uh, against Pontius, and of course Sulla, he, it's his turn, uh, and so he's going to take the army. But meanwhile, Marius, he'd like to have some of that fame and glory, even though he's getting older now. 
And so there's a struggle over who's going to be in command. And Marius is pulling strings, and and uh, Sula is, you know, they're trying to sort of edge Sula out. Uh, and it's the question is who's going to to go and beat up on Pontius? And eventually it's going to happen, but uh, that does delay things just a bit. Uh, Sula, we haven't talked much about him. He's now engaged in a power struggle with Marius, uh, and he. His response is that he marches on Rome with six legions. Now, he's supposed to be marching on Pontius, but instead he turns his attention to Rome, and he marches with his army, who are loyal to their general, and he marches on Rome. And no Roman had ever done this before. It just wasn't done. And he marches on Rome, and he institutes a reign of terror. And he comes into the Senate, and he says... Uh, uh, I've got a list of all the people uh, that are enemies of the Senate, and and they're all going to be put to death. And he posts the list, and, and those people are all killed. And the next day he comes in, and he says, you know, I forgot to put some names. And he, he, he has another big list. Uh, and these lists continue to grow and and develop. Uh, Marius doesn't have an army around him, so he, he goes into hiding. He flees the area. And these executions become a daily event. Uh, these prescription lists are published daily in the Senate, and it is said that you would go into the Senate to see if you were going to live or die. Uh, the, a story is told of, of one senator who comes in. Uh, he's, he's so concerned about different people that he's heard that are being put to death, and, and uh, he goes to, to look at the list, and, and lo and behold, his, his name is on it. Uh, and on his way home that day, somebody kills him, because if your name is on the list, then it's free territory to put you to death. And after a while, Sewell is not out, and he's gotten rid of all of his enemies, and now he's getting rid of any enemies of friends or people that want to be friendly toward him. Um, and it is said that somebody might be put to death just because they had a nice garden, and somebody else was coveting it. And so it's a way to get their possessions. Um, uh, for example, one Roman looks at the list and he says, Oh my, my, my swimming pool has done me in. Uh, it is going to have me put to death. Um, and, and it's just a terrible time during this period. Plutarch, in his life of Sulla, says, Sulla now began to make blood flow, and he filled the city with deaths without number. Or a limit. Rome had never seen anything like this before. Popularities now are excluded from passing laws. Um, the Centuriate Assembly is not going to per be permitted to bring a law to the Senate. The Senate is the one uh, that is going to be passing all laws. Uh, these reforms are given to strengthen the Senate. Uh, the tribunes, they're uh, they're told if you become a tribune, you cannot hold any other office after that. That's the end of your political career. Um, and Sulla finally, um, actually we, we find out he, be, he comes down with a diagnosis. He's got some sort of illness, uh, very serious. Uh, and he retires, leaving the Senate in control of everything. And within a year, he has died. But what Sulla has done, he has showed everyone that it is possible to strong arm the Roman Republic, whoever has the military might, will be able to make his will uh, accomplished. Now the death of, the death of uh, Sulla left a power vacuum, and into that vacuum comes two up-and-coming politicians slash generals. One of them is young Pompey. Pompey had been one of the generals under Sulla, a very young fellow in his 20s, uh, and very successful in, in fighting in Africa. He had come back home, and he had told Sulla, I want the honor of a triumph. And Sulla said, well, you're sort of young to have that, and, and normally that's reserved for somebody who's held the position of consul. You haven't he held any positions. You're just a general. Uh, Pompey said, I don't care. I, I want a, a triumph. And Sulla had allowed him that triumph, uh, had also allowed him, he, he uh, gave himself a nickname. You know how people get nicknames. And you have Alexander, who's called Alexander the Great. And Pompey gave himself the nickname, Pompey, uh, Pompeius Magnus, Pompey the Great. Uh, and, and people sort of wondered about that. In fact, uh, people, some people had told uh, Pompey he looked a little bit like Alexander. And he, he took to trying to emulate Alexander the Great. Uh, and he, he wanted to be Pompey the Great. Uh, another uh, politician at this point was Crassus, 
Uh, Crassus didn't have the same military background that Pompey had, but Crassus had become the wealthiest man in all of Rome. Uh, he had uh, hit upon a, a new way to make money. He owned the fire department, and whenever a fire broke out, he would come to the owner of the building that was beginning to burn down and said, I will sell you that. Uh, I will buy that building from you. Um, for, let's pretend it was uh, 200 pieces of gold, and he said, well, it was worth 200,000. Uh, 200, uh, well, you can either have 200, you can have nothing. Um, and then once, uh, once the deal was made, then he, would, then he would put out the fire and thereby uh, get money. Uh, he would also sell, uh, it seems like he would sell some sort of fire insurance, um, and if you didn't uh, have his insurance, then your building might begin burning on its own. You know, just, just these sorts of things could happen. And so Crassus... Uh, becomes very, very wealthy. In fact, Crassus said, uh, you shouldn't count anyone wealthy unless they can fund, unless they can pay for their own private army. Uh, and Crassus is able to do that. Now, it's, during, it's in 73 BC that there's a slave revolt. There had been other slave revolts uh, throughout the Roman Empire, but this is the first one in Italy. Uh, the Spartacus Revolt uh, is a number of gladiators uh, broke out of their training facility in central Italy, and they institute a revolt and and the Romans send a legion to go down and deal with them, and they defeat the Roman legion. Uh, unheard of. But remember, the Romans never quit. And so now Crassus is given command, and he uh, raises a number of legions. They come up against the uh, Spartacus and his, his gladiator army, and they manage to trap them. And he's ab about to finish them off. He's really done quite a job of surrounding them, cutting off their supplies, and, and going to finish off, uh, when meanwhile from Spain, Pompey comes and, and Pompey says, oh, I, I can see you can use some help. And, and Crass says, oh, I don't need any help. And Pompey says, well, I'm going to give you help anyway. And in doing so, is stealing some of the glory from Crassus. So the word's going to go out. Yes, uh, the Spartacus revolt was put down by Crassus and by Pompey, uh, with the help of Pompey. When the revolt is put down, the slaves are crucified in a line going out from, from Rome that stretches some 35 miles. Um, and the Romans hope never to face a slave revolt again. Meanwhile, there's another, another problem that's uh, been arising. It's the problem of piracy. Um, and a number of people have been taken hostage, even senators' wives. In fact, even young Julius Caesar, we'll talk about next time, had been captured and held for ransom for a time by pirates. And so these, and, and these pirates are actually threatening to cut off the supply line of food coming to, to Italy, to Rome, from Egypt. Uh, because those ships have to sail past uh, the Cyclades and Crete and, and Greece, places where the pirates love to have their, their, uh, their ports. And so Pompey is, uh, is given a commission to clear the seas of pirates. Uh, special powers that he is given, and he is going to be giving, uh, given these powers for a period of five years, and he has victory over them. He, he sails out and he attacks a number of their ports, and he captures the ringleaders and crucifies them, but many, of the, many other of the pirates, instead of crucifying them, he says, now you can be you can be hard-working Roman, Roman colonists. Uh, they're not citizens, but they will be under the sway of Rome. And he gives them land grants and allows them to set up farms and turn to farming instead of being a pirate. Uh, from here, he continues on to the east. He comes to Syria, and he takes Syria and makes it a Roman province. And while he's up in Syria at Damascus, um, meanwhile, down in Jerusalem, there are two of the descendants of the Maccabees, two of the Hasmonean brothers, uh, and they are, they are fighting each other in a civil war for the throne of Jerusalem. And they both send messages to Pompey saying, will you come and get rid of this brother of mine? And Pompey says, okay. And now Pompey marches down and he captures Jerusalem. He captures Judea, uh, or Judah as it was called, and he renames it as a Roman province. He's going to rename it and it will now become Judea. The story is told in Josephus how Pompey comes to the temple in 63 BC and he's heard about this great temple that the Jews have and he's curious to see what their God looks like because you go into any pagan temple you'll see a statue of their God and he goes into the temple he actually goes into the Holy of Holies and there's nothing there 
you know, back in in the days of of King David and well Solomon and and kings after Solomon, uh, there had been uh, the temple and then the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant. But that had that had long been gone. Uh, that had disappeared after the, uh, the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it's now been rebuilt, but there's, there's, there's no Ark of the Covenant. He goes into the Holy of Holies, and there's nothing there. And he comes out, and he says, gee, this is sort of odd. They, they don't have a God in there. Uh, but Judea now will be a Roman province. Pompey comes back to, to Rome uh, with, his, uh, with his triumph and with his various uh, um, areas that he has annexed to Rome. And he seeks to have the Roman Senate um, confirm all of these decisions that he has made. And the Roman Senate is blocking him in all sorts of ways. And so he looks to form a partnership. And he goes, of all people, to his old nemesis, Crassus. These two had been sort of competitors. But they are going to team up. And for a time, the, the two of them run and they are consul. But after they step down, because you can only be consul for a year... That, that had changed after Marius, who had held the consulship r- repeatedly, um, they're, they're going to step down, and they're going to need somebody else to continue to pass their bills. And so you will have a secret, a secret triumvirate, a three-way partnership. And uh, as I said, it's secret at first, although it will soon become apparent, where Pompey and Crassus have teamed up with a young rising politician by the name of Gaius Julius Caesar. And we will talk about him next time. And we'll talk about how Julius Caesar is going to change the face of Rome.